I want to do something of a literary study on the character of Prometheus, uh, who is the hero of the Greek playwright Aeschylus' tragedy, Prometheus Bound, and on how the character gradually came to be conflated with Satan in the arts uh, leading up to the 19th century. If you're not familiar with Greek mythology, the first thing you're probably asking yourself is, who is Prometheus? Uh, we read in Aeschylus' play and in other sources that Prometheus is a titan, uh, one of the older gods who ruled in the heavens before the newer gods, led by Zeus, uh, came up and overthrew them. And you can already see that there are parallels here with the war in heaven, uh, which we read about in Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, but there are also some key differences too. Uh, Prometheus is gifted with the ability of foresight. He can see things before they happen. It's a Jedi trick. Uh, sorry, kind of uh, just followed naturally. Uh, and this is a gift that he shares with his mother, uh, Themis, uh, in this play at least. If you pick up a volume on Greek mythology, or even if you read another Greek tragedy, uh, the details of the Prometheus story uh, sometimes differ. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes he is the creator of the human race, and other times, such as in this play, uh, he's just their benefactor. So Prometheus sides with the new gods against the old ones. Uh, he helps Zeus to overthrow the leader of the Titans, Cronus, and to cast the others into Tartarus. The reason he gives for helping Zeus is that the Titans wouldn't listen to his counsel. Uh, he said that victory couldn't be decided by force, but through guile, uh, that is, through intelligent planning as opposed to just uh, brute strength. And this is a recurring theme throughout the play. Uh, Prometheus is something of a thinker, an intellectual. He makes plans and he sticks to them in order to get his way. Other characters, most notably Zeus himself, rely solely on physical force, on might, uh, to cram their agendas through on others. Uh, they're very authoritarian in their way of thinking. Uh, so, Zeus takes the throne, and immediately conflict arises. He announces that he wants to wipe out the human race, uh, who have been living up until now in apparently an Eden-like state of pre-technological uh, ignorance. Prometheus has compassion on the humans, uh, he wants to save the humans, and so he commits his great crime. Uh, he steals the gift of fire uh, from the gods and gives it to mankind. Now, what is this uh, gift of fire? Uh, in the play, it seems to be more than just fire itself. It's also what fire represents. Uh, listen to Prometheus. Uh, this is kind of a long passage, but it's very detailed and uh, gives a good example of what all fire encompasses. Uh, listen to him uh, describing what he did for mankind that made Zeus so angry. Uh, he says... Uh, well, one, he's complaining about um, how the gods are ungrateful to him because he distributed their honors to them. Uh, he says, I'll say no more of this, you know it all. But hear what troubles there, are, there were among mortals, how I found them mindless but made them intelligent and masters of their minds. I'll tell you this, not blaming human beings, but to explain the goodwill of my gifts. For humans in the beginning had eyes but saw to no purpose. They had ears but did not hear. Like the shapes of dreams they dragged through their long lives and muddled everything haphazardly. They did not know how to build brick houses to face the sun, nor how to work in wood. They lived beneath the earth like swarming ants in sunless caves. For them there was no secure token for telling winter or flowering spring, nor summer with its crops, and all they did they did without intelligent calculation until I showed them the rising of the stars and the settings hard to observe. And I invented numbers for them, preeminent among all skills, and the combining of written letters is a means of remembering all things, the muse's mother, skilled in craft. It was I who first yoked beasts to be slaves in harness and under pack saddles as substitutes for humans in hard tasks, and I harnessed to the carriage obedient horses, the crowning pride of wealth and luxury, it was I and none other who discovered ships, sail-winged wagons that bear men over the sea. Such, to my misery, were the devices which I discovered for mortals, but I have no clever means to rid myself of my own present affliction. If you hear the rest, you will marvel even more at the crafts and the resources I contrived. Greatest was this. When one of mankind fell sick, there was no defense for him, neither healing food nor drink, 
For lack of cures they wasted until I showed them the blending of mild remedies with which they drive away all kinds of sickness. The many ways of prophecy I charted, I was the first to judge what out of dreams came truly real, and for mankind I gave meaning to ominous cries, heart of interpretation, and to the significance of road encounters. The flight of hook-taloned birds I analyzed, which of them were in nature propitious and which unlucky. What habits each species has, what are their hates and loves and affiliations. Also I taught of the smoothness of the entrails and what color the bile should have to please the gods, and the dappled symmetry of the liver lobe. It was I who burned the thigh bones wrapped in fat and the long shank bone. I set mortals on the road to the murky craft of divination, making the flaming signs, once dim, now clear to see. So much for these things. Then beneath the earth those hidden blessings, copper, iron, silver, and gold, who can claim to have discovered them before me? No one, I am sure, who wants to speak to the purpose. In one short sentence, understand it all. All human arts come from Prometheus. And so all of these advances in technology, in agriculture, in mining, and even in religion are summarized in the idea of fire here. And it really is an old idea or image uh, that somehow the discovery of fire led to the birth of civilization. It's for this reason that Prometheus is bound. Uh, Zeus is angry that he's given this tremendous gift to creatures of a day, they're called, uh, who he apparently doesn't believe to be worthy of it. Uh, maybe in his eyes it would be like the rich old lady, and this has happened, uh, who dies and leaves millions of dollars to her pet dog. Uh, we're, we're all a bit outraged at that. Uh, what is a little dog going to do with millions of dollars? Uh, and I think that uh, that's Zeus's attitude, toward in the, uh, Zeus's attitude in the play uh, toward us as humans. So Prometheus is chained to a high rock, uh, presumably forever, and a spike is driven through his chest by one of his fellow gods that used to be his friend, uh, but who doesn't want to go against Zeus. And again, uh, this is because Zeus's only claim to rule is through his superior strength. And this is illustrated by the personifications of might and violence, uh, two characters who torment Prometheus at the start of the play. Uh, it's through might and violence uh, that Zeus imposes his will on others, and they only obey out of necessity. Uh, but Prometheus doesn't. Uh, he displays a great amount of uh, free will in resisting the dictates of the new tyrant god, and while this is something that modern readers might find admirable about him and uh, praiseworthy, uh, virtually every other character in the play sees this as a fault. Prometheus is visited by a series of characters, and one thing that they all have in common is that they berate him for his stubbornness, because he won't make obedience to Zeus's greater power. Uh, listen to what one of the characters, uh, Father Ocean, uh, says to Prometheus. He says, I want to advise you for the best for all your cleverness. Know yourself and reform your ways to new ways, for new is he that rules among the gods. But if you throw about such angry words, words that are wedded swords, soon Zeus will hear you, even though his seat aloft is far removed, and then your present multitude of pains will seem like child's play. My poor friend, give up this angry mood of yours, and look for ways of freeing yourself from these troubles. Maybe what I say seems to you both old and commonplace, but this is what you pay, Prometheus, for that tongue of yours, which talked so high and haughty. You are not yet humble, still you do not yield to your misfortunes, and you wish indeed to add some more to them. Now, if you follow me as your teacher, you will not rear and kick against the rider's whip, seeing that our king ruling alone is harsh, and sends accounts to no one's audit for the deeds he does. Uh, so, uh, he's basically saying, I know you have this uh, gripe with Zeus, but you're going to have to get over it. Uh, and he also accuses Prometheus of pride of not being able to control his tongue in the presence of his superiors. And it's interesting to uh, think about what kind of message, message Aeschylus is sending to his audience here, uh, because while that is good practical advice, uh, the idea of holding one's tongue when one is in the right is morally uh, distasteful uh, to all of us, I think. Uh, one might ask, is Aeschylus finding fault with Prometheus here as well, um, or is he having all of these other characters come in and give bad advice to tempt or to test him, in much the way that Job's friends do in the book of Job? Uh, the other characters in the play 
don't seem concerned at all about what is right or what's wrong. They're just concerned about how to act in such a way that they can live uh, happy, peaceful lives. Uh, but of course, this is how tyrannies are established. And since I already made one Star Wars reference in this uh, study, I'll make another. Uh, remember that in Star Wars, Emperor Palpatine kicks off his dictatorship uh, by promising uh, peace and security uh, after uh, years of war. And everybody just starts clapping because they're tired of the conflict and they just want to go about and have a good time. Uh, Prome Prometheus displays a sort of repugnance for the servility of the others. And he's the only person to show any sort of concern for the human race. Uh, another character who comes to visit him in his confinement is Io. Uh, and she is a woman who's in the process of being transformed into a cow, uh, as strange as that sounds. I think it's up to us as the readers to decide how far along this transformation has taken place. Uh, the script tells us that she has horns, but that's about it. Uh, we learn about Io's backstory through her speech. Uh, th though uh, the original theater goers in ancient Athens would have already known most of her story because she's another character from mythology. Uh, Zeus fell in love with her and made advances, and it's kind of vague how she felt about the whole thing, but from what we know about Zeus, he probably wouldn't have taken her feelings into consideration one way or the other, uh, and he was caught sleeping with her by his wife, Hera. Uh, he managed to use his powers to transform her into a cow just before Hera arrived uh, to hide the fact that he'd been with another woman. Uh, why did he pick a cow? Who knows? Uh, maybe there were other cows nearby. Uh, they were in a field, maybe, and he wanted her to blend in. But uh, Hera is still suspicious and devises a number of uh, strategies to torment Io, uh, one of them being to set a supernatural gadfly to bite her and send her wandering over the face of the earth to escape it. And it's while Io is talking to Prometheus uh, that he lets slip that he knows something concerning Zeus's future, uh, that Zeus is going to sleep with a woman who will give birth to a child who is stronger than its father. It's by this child, Prometheus says, that Zeus will be overthrown. Uh, Prometheus clings to the secret that he has uh, because he knows that it's going to be his only leverage he has uh, to get released from his bonds. Uh, but Zeus, who has apparently been listening in the clouds, sends messengers to get the secret out of Prometheus, uh, but he won't talk. Uh, so here we have Zeus, who through his power and his might can do anything that he wants, uh, except uh, to make Prometheus spill the beans. And so here's an example of a collision of necessity and free will, uh, of an unstoppable force meeting an unmovable object. And the play ends uh, as the earth begins to shake and lightning flashes through the sky and Prometheus dares Zeus to do his worst. Uh, now, let's look at Satan. Uh, and for this video, I'm going to confine our discussion of him uh, to his representation in Milton's Paradise Lost. If we start bringing in scriptural references, that would need a whole other video uh, because there's a lot of them. Uh, but we find in Paradise Lost that the main difference between the two stories is that God is justified in his rule, while Zeus is not. God is the supreme sovereign through right, not might, uh, and, this, and uh, not through violence either. And his character and his moral compass reflect this. Uh, this is why the inclusion, I think, of Io and Prometheus Bound was important. Uh, he, she's an example of the type of ruler that Zeus is. Uh, he's selfish and he's rash and he doesn't think things through and he makes life worse for those around him. Uh, the presence of Io is a condemnation of Zeus's character, uh, evidence that morally he's unfit to rule even if he can physically lord it over the other gods by might. Uh, so Satan's rebellion against God's right to rule is worthy of condemnation, while Prometheus's rebellion against Zeus's might uh, makes him stubborn, yes, but also admirable. And it's clear from the beginning that Satan isn't rebelling against God because God is oppressive, uh, but only because he wants to rule. And as he's addressing his fallen legions in hell in Book 1 of Paradise Lost, uh, he says uh, this, Is this the region, this the soil, the clime, said then the lost archangel, this the seat that we must change for heaven, this mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Interesting. 
farthest from him is best, whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors! Hail, infernal world! In thou profoundest hell receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. What matter where if I be still the same, and what I should be, but all less, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. Here at least we shall be free. Uh, so uh, you can tell from that passage, um, he's sad that he's lost out on the celestial light of heaven, uh, but ruling is really what's on his mind. Uh, that and now also uh, he wants revenge. Uh, he wants to strike out at God and hurt him in some way. And the way that he goes about that is to corrupt the human race. Uh, he's heard a prophecy that humans are about to be created and that God intends to make them equal with the angels. And really, this is the second big difference between Satan and Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus wanted to help the human race, uh, but from how Satan talks about them, it sounds like he has the same fate planned for them that Zeus had uh, for mortals in his play. Uh, he says, uh, There is a place, if ancient and prophetic fame in heaven err not, another world, the happy seat of some new race called man, about this time to be created, like to us, though less in power and excellence, but favored more of him who rules above. So was his will pronounced among the gods, and by an oath that shook heaven's whole circumference confirmed. Thither let us bend all our thoughts to learn what creatures there inhabit, of what mold or substance, how endued and what their power, and where their weakness, how attempted best by force or subtlety. Though heaven be shut, and heaven's high arbitrator sit secure in his own strength, this place may lie exposed, uh, the utmost border of his kingdom, left to their defense who hold it. Here, perhaps, some advantageous act may be achieved by sudden onset, either with hellfire to waste his whole creation, or possess all as our own, and drive, as we were driven, the puny habitants, or if not drive, seduce them to our party, that their god may prove their foe, and with repenting hand abolish his own works. Uh, so uh, the relationship between the ruler and the rebel are completely different here, and also the motives governing the rebels are as different as can be as well. Um, Satan wants to see the human race either enslaved or abolished by uh, their creator, uh, who uh, is going to be disgusted by the low state to which Satan plans to uh, bring them. Uh, but there's a moment uh, where Satan... He's uh, in the guise of the serpent, and he's watching Eve in the garden, uh, where he feels something like remorse for what he's about to do. Uh, Milton says that his passion bursts from inward grief. And uh, he says this, uh, The more I see pleasures about me, so much more I feel torment within me, as from the hateful siege of contraries. All good to me becomes bane, and in heaven much worse would be my state. But neither here seek I, no, nor in heaven to dwell, unless by mastering heaven supreme. Nor hope to be myself less miserable by what I seek, but others to make such as I, though thereby worse to me redound. For only in destroying I find ease to my relentless thoughts. So he knows that he's only going to cause worse pain for himself, in other words, and for those around him, by what he's about to do. But he's so consumed with anger and vengeance that he's going to do it anyway. He says only in destroying he finds ease. Uh, so again, while Satan and Prometheus have superficial similarities, there are some real differences there as well. Uh, so, how did they become conflated? Well, anti-religious writers in the 18th and 19th centuries tended to blend the two stories because they saw the Christian church and by extension, the Christian God, as being oppressive, uh, hostile to free speech and free will. Uh, they took a view of God that was more akin to Aeschylus's version of Zeus than it was to the true nature of God, which we find in the Bible. Uh, writers such as Voltaire and Percy Shelley uh, both saw Milton's Satan and the legend of Prometheus as symbols of rebellion against established authority. This is why, in the 19th century, there were many works inspired by, or at least alluding to, Aeschylus' play. 
uh, Percy Shelley, who was a poet, actually wrote his own play uh, called Prometheus Unbound, while his wife, Mary Shelley, uh, gave her novel Frankenstein the subtitle A Modern Prometheus. In that novel, we see Victor Frankenstein imbuing his inanimate creation with the spark of life in the same way that Prometheus boasts that he gave ignorant, brutish mankind the spark of life by giving them the gift of fire. Lord Byron, uh, another 19th century poet and a friend of Percy Shelley, uh, wrote a piece about Prometheus that I like and that I want to end this study on. I don't want to read the whole poem, uh, but I'll read just a section of it. Um, he says... Thy godlike crime was to be kind, to render with thy precepts less the sum of human wretchedness, and strengthen man with his own mind. And baffled as thou wert from high, still in thy patient energy, and the endurance and repulse of thine impenetrable spirit, which earth and heaven could not convulse, a mighty lesson we inherit. Thou art a symbol and a sign to mortals of their fate and force. Like thee, man is in part divine, a troubled stream from a pure source. And man in portions can foresee his own funeral destiny, his wretchedness and his resistance and his sad unallied existence, to which his spirit may oppose itself, and equal to all woes, and a firm will and a deep sense which even in torture can descry its own concentered recompense, triumphant where it dares defy, and making death a victory. So... Uh, yeah, he sees Prometheus as an example uh, that strong-willed individuals can follow to withstand the forces of life and the forces of nature, but also the forces of heaven. And this is a description of the character type that came to be known as the Byronic hero, uh, one who is an outcast due to a rebellious nature or to some failure to conform with the common herd of man. Again, it's that uh, rebellion against established authority that's the tie-in here. Uh, but it makes all the difference whether that authority is ruling justly or unjustly uh, when we consider whether those rebelling against it are to be admired or disapproved of. Check out my other video on Romans chapter 13, Who Should Christians Obey, for a, a more detailed study on that subject. Uh, so that's going to be it for this video. I hope it was interesting, and uh, thanks for watching.